أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful, the one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon His pure and beloved Messenger, the peak of His creation, the symbol of humanity, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. And his immaculate, pure progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraja. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. One of the very important discussions in Islamic history and theology is the stance of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, towards the rulers of their time, the caliphs of their time. There is an important historical debate that is highly contested an important point that is highly disputed amongst the schools of thought. And that is, did the Imams of Ahlul Bayt pledge allegiance to the Caliphs of their time or no? Starting from the first Imam of Ahlul Bayt, the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi alayhi. Allahumma salli ala. Did he pledge allegiance to the caliphs of his time? And if he did, does that not mean that the Imam gave them legitimacy and he recognized their religious authority? The same applies to the subsequent Imams. The second Imam, the third Imam, the fourth Imam. Did they pledge allegiance to the rulers and the caliphs of their era, of their time. This is an important topic that requires close examination for us to better understand the stance of our Imams and whether they gave legitimacy to the rulers of their time. We begin by analyzing the stance of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam and then we'll shed some light on Al Imam Al Hassan whether he pledged allegiance Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam did he pledge allegiance or not and we end with the fourth Imam of Ahl al Bayt Al Imam Zayn al Abidin salawatullahi alayhi did he pledge allegiance to the ruler of his time or not when you come to the first Imam of Ahl al Bayt Al Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, you will find that the issue of the bay'ah, pledging allegiance to the ruler of his time, is highly disputed amongst the schools of thought. Many will come out and say that yes, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he pledged allegiance to the ruler of his time who was Abu Bakr. He recognized his leadership and thereby he gave him legitimacy. So you People who claim, who call yourselves the Shia, what's all this fuss about? For 14 centuries, you've created division in the Muslim Ummah by saying that your Imams did not pledge allegiance or that they did not give legitimacy. What's all this about? When we have historical indications that he did actually give bay'ah, that he did pledge allegiance. For example, you will find them Referring to our books, Shia books, such as the book of Al-Ihtijaj by Al-Tabarsi, which states clearly that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam extended his hand and he pledged allegiance to Abu Bakr. So when you have these references in your own books, why have you created this historical controversy? 
which has created so much division amongst the sects. When there are clear proofs that your Imam, which you follow and see as infallible, he pledged allegiance. He gave his bay'ah to the caliph of his time. How do we address these historical references in our books and the books of other schools of thought which clearly indicate that the Imam السلام, pledged allegiance. How do we analyze this event and this act for us to better understand the stance of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, towards the rulers and caliphs who came after the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Let's begin by first examining our narrations because it is very important to know the circumstances in which the Imam السلام, pledged allegiance or supposedly pledged allegiance. What were the circumstances? Because the circumstances make a big difference. For example, if you go to the book of Al-Khisal by Al-Saduq, one of the greatest scholars of the past, he gives us an image of what happened. In his book, he narrates that after Abu Bakr assumed the caliphate, 12 members from the Muhajireen and the Ansar, the migrants and the helpers, the people who had migrated from Mecca and those who were in Medina, 12 of them, they refused to pledge allegiance. They gathered amongst themselves and they said, we're not going to pledge allegiance. Because he, we don't recognize him to be the rightful successor to the Holy Prophet. For example, amongst them was Salman, Abu Dhar, Al-Miqdad, Ammar ibn Yasir, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Initially, they refused to pledge allegiance. From the Ansar, you had Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, you had the Shahadatain. So they were confused. What should we do? Should we fight? Should we resist? So they decided to go and consult Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib Let's go consult him. What advice does he give us? Should we pledge allegiance or not? They approached the Imam Ali salam. They told him, Oh Ali, what are you doing? How is it that you have forsaken the Khilafah when you are the rightful heir to it? How did you let go of your right? The Imam السلام, told them, look, calm down, let me explain to you my situation. I've contemplated this, I've consulted my family members. These people forced me to pledge allegiance to Abu Bakr. Had I not done that, and if you also do not do that, if you want to put a fight, if you want to draw your sword and resist, there will be bloodshed in Medina. They are willing to kill and slaughter all of you. And many more Muslims will be slaughtered. And I have a will from the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, that if I have 40 men, serious, who are willing to defend the truth, then yes, I will go and take my right. But I could not find 40 men. The Imam السلام, was abandoned. The Prophet told me, Oh Ali, you shall be betrayed. Therefore, for the sake of Muslim unity, for the sake of the religion of Islam, to save this new faith. Just 23 years ago, our Prophet brought this faith. To save it from extinction and from bloodshed, I had to give up my right. And therefore, I did not rise to fight. So clearly we see in this hadith that the Imam alayhi salam says, I was forced to pledge allegiance. The same book of Al-Ihtijaj, which they cite, stating that the Imam pledged allegiance, you know, sometimes they just copy and paste, they don't give you the full context or the circumstances in which the Imam alayhi salam pledged allegiance. What were those circumstances? The same book of Al-Ihtijaj in that same hadith which confirms that the Imam pledged allegiance, he tells us what happened. They stormed into the house of the Imam, they raided his house, they took him out shackled with shackles. They arrested him. 
Then they took him to the mosque of the Prophet. They put the sword on his head, above his head. And they told him, Ali, give bay'ah. Pledge allegiance. The Imam السلام, said, what happens if I don't? They told him, if you don't, then we will kill you right here in the masjid. The Imam السلام, said, then you will be killing the servant of God and the brother of the Prophet. They told him, as for the servant of God, yes, you are the servant of God. But as for the brother of the Prophet, no, you're not the brother of the Prophet. He told them, SubhanAllah, did you not hear when the Prophet assigned me as his brother? In Mecca and in Medina, when he came to Medina, don't we have the event of the brotherhood? In which he assigned the migrants to be the brothers of the Ansar? And he declared me as his brother, how can you deny me this right? Oh you companions, how many of you witnessed this? Some of them said, yes, we remember this, we witnessed this. But they denied him that. They said, no, we will not recognize you as the brother of the Prophet. We will kill you right here if you don't pledge allegiance. In that case, the Imam السلام, pledged allegiance according to this hadith and the book of Al-Ihtijaj. Therefore, when you examine the circumstances of what happened, you will find that the Imam السلام, was coerced into pledging allegiance. Now this is from our books. We have a number of other hadiths in the book of Kafi, for example, that says the Imam السلام, was forced into pledging allegiance. Another hadith by Hamran ibn Ayyan, one of the companions of the sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt and the fifth Imam. He says, I heard Al Imam Abi Ja'far السلام, who's Al Imam Al Baqir, peace be upon him. He said, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, pledged allegiance when he saw the smoke emanating from his house. What does that mean? What were the circumstances? Now this was from our sources. Now when you go to the Sunni sources about the bay'ah of the Imam to the first Khalifa, you will find prominent Sunni scholars such as Ibn Abd Rabbah in his book Al-Aqd Al-Farid. He says that Abu Bakr dispatched Umar with a number of companions, with a number of people with him, he told him, go to the house of Ali and Fatima, and you make sure that you bring him, along with Al-Abbas, along with al zubair Bring them. They have to pledge allegiance to me. And if they resist, fight them. Fight them. And then this hadith says that he went to the house, of Fatima alayhi salam. He told Fatima, if your husband Ali does not come to give bay'ah, we will burn down the house. Who's narrating this? Ibn Abd Rabbah in his book al Abd al-Farid. Therefore the Imam alayhi salam went and gave bay'ah. You have Al-Baladhari, another prominent Sunni scholar, in his book and sab al-Ashraf. What does he say? He clearly states, and he mentions a number of narrations, one from Ibn Abbas, one from Uday ibn Hatim. They clearly state that the Imam السلام, when you examine the circumstances of the bay'ah, it was under force, under compulsion. Uday ibn Hatim, he says, never did I feel bad for someone like I felt for Ali ibn Abi Talib on the day when they dragged him, shackled, arrested. And they told him, we shall kill you. And he told them, you shall be killing the brother of the Prophet if you kill me. So we have these historical references that confirm the Imam السلام, was forced and coerced into the bay'ah. Now there are several important points here. One point is that we know that Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, the commander of the faithful, was the master of courage and bravery. So what? Let them threaten him. Could anyone threaten Amir al-Mu'mineen السلام? Wasn't he the one who lifted the door of Khaybar? The Imam السلام, represented the symbol and the peak and the pinnacle of courage and bravery. Who can threaten Amir al-Mu'mineen? When we examine this event, respected brothers and sisters, it's not a matter of courage or bravery. 
Courage is courage in its right place. When it exceeds its limit, courage is no longer courage, it's recklessness. You know, some people, they think they're courageous, they take it too far in the name of courage and bravery. But that is actually recklessness, you're being reckless. The Imam alayhi salam was courageous, he was brave, but he was not reckless. It's not a matter of bravery or courage, it's a matter of saving and preserving the religion of Islam. The Imam alayhi salam was very clear that if he wanted to resist, be sure there was no Islam today. Because what had happened is that those who assumed power, they made an alliance with a number of tribes around the city of Medina, such as the tribe of Bani Aslam. They had 10,000 fighters, armed fighters. They flooded the streets of Medina shortly after the Saqifa. The Imam السلام, knew very well that if he would resist, there will be mass bloodshed in Medina. Most Muslims would perish. All the believers like Salman, Ammar, Abu Dhar, al miqdad they would be killed and perished. The Imam is going to be an Imam over who? Over rivers of blood? So it's not a matter of courage. It was a matter of preserving the religion of Islam. For the sake of the religion of Islam, the Imam السلام, had to give up his right to the Caliphate, to the apparent Caliphate. Otherwise, he's chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's not a matter of courage or bravery. That's number one. Number two, once I was discussing this with a Sunni brother, and he told me when he gave bay'ah, don't you believe that your Imams of Ahlul Bayt, they're rightly guided by God? They're supported by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're infallible? Well, how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't support Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib then and there? How come Allah allowed him to give the bay'ah even under these circumstances where he was forced and compelled to give the bay'ah? I told him, my dear friend, do you believe that Prophet Harun was a prophet of God? He said, yes. I told him, was he guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He said, yes. I told him, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, when he walked into the masjid and he realized that the sword was drawn above him and that they attempted to kill him if he would refuse to give the bay'ah, he cited a very important verse in the Holy Quran. A verse that Harun said when Musa came back. When Musa السلام, came, came back and he received the tablets of the Torah, he came back to his Ummah, to the Bani Israel, and he saw that the Ummah was in chaos. He left for 40 days, and what happened? These people who saw all these miracles, because some people will tell you, you know what, this is impossible for all these companions who met the Prophet, they participated in his battles, they saw his miracles, then for them suddenly, overnight to abandon the Prophet. Habibi, what did the Qawm of Musa do to him? He split the sea for them, for God's sake. They saw Fir'aun drown. They saw the snake. The stick turned into a snake. Do you want miracles bigger than that? The miracles of Prophet Musa, when it comes to physical terms and what the eye can see, were greater than the miracles of the Holy Prophet. It's something everyone, even the uneducated people could see. Imagine splitting the sea. Is there something greater than that? Prophet Musa salam, he went for 40 days. He came back, he saw Bani Israel worshipping the calf. Worshipping the calf! Not worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going back to idolatry, going back to shirk. He was shocked. He looked at his brother Musa, he told him, and his brother Harun, he told him, Harun, what's going on here? You see them worshipping the calf, and you didn't do anything? You didn't stop them? See what the Quran says. What did he reply? قَالَ يَبْنَ أُمْ إِنَّ الْقَوْمَ اسْتَضْعَفُونِي وَكَادُوا يَقْتُلُونَنِي 
my dear brother, the son of my mother, these people overpowered me and they attempted to kill me. And I was concerned that if I would resist, there would be chaos, there would be disunity, bloodshed, and then you would come back and you would tell me, Oh Harun, look at the disunity you've created. You've destroyed my ummah. This is something that the Qur'an documents. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam is guided by Allah, but he mentioned the same verse. He looked at the grave of the Prophet and he said these verses, Oh my brother, they have overpowered me and they have threatened to kill me. What was I going to do? So the Imam salam by reciting this verse, he's bringing our attention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does guide the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. However, there's also a test, there's also a divine plan. There's also a will from the Prophet and he has to abide by the will of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. That's the second point. The third point here, according to Islamic law, as recognized by all schools of thought, if someone commits an act under coercion and force, is that act valid or not? For example, someone forces you to sell your house. This transaction of buying and selling, according to Islamic law, if you do that under coercion, is that valid or not valid? According to Islamic law, it's not valid. If someone puts a gun to your head and tells you divorce your wife right now, and you divorce your wife, is this legitimate or no? No, it's not. According to Islamic law, any act that you do, if it's done under coercion, it's not valid. And the bay'ah is no exception. Pledging allegiance is an act that you pledge allegiance to the caliph or the ruler of your time. If this is done under coercion and compulsion, this has no value. This is void, it's nullified. This is according to Islamic law. So the Imam alayhi salam, even if you bring these sources which confirm that he gave bay'ah under coercion, at the end of the day, is this bay'ah valid or not valid? Subhanallah, when you look at the Holy Quran, we see that the Prophet, peace be upon him, never forced anyone to give the bay'ah. The Quran is very clear, for example, in one verse, O Prophet, when the believing woman come to you to give bay'ah. They come to you to give bay'ah, not you enforce the bay'ah on them. Then, with these conditions, accept their bay'ah. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يُبَايِعْنَكَ The Qur'an is very clear that when it comes to bay'ah, we don't have bay'ah that's by force, bay'ah that's by coercion. Therefore, according to Islamic law, any act that is done under force, under compulsion, under coercion, it's nullified. Therefore, the act of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, giving the bay'ah, in no way does it give legitimacy to the caliph of his time, because it was done under coercion. In no way did the Imam salam, authorize them. So therefore, when we examine our Islamic history, we see that the Imam salam never gave them legitimacy. And what happened was by compulsion. There's an interesting hadith in the tafsir of Ayashi. He even shed some light more on exactly what happened. He says when they brought Amir al-Mu'mineen salam into the mosque and they threatened to kill him, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, he heard that Imam Ali is now arrested, he's in the mosque, and he is being threatened to be killed. Al-Abbas, he was uncomfortable with this. He was shocked. He was worried about his nephew, about Imam Ali. So he came running to the mosque, and he told them, look, please don't kill my nephew. Spare him. Do not kill him, and we'll give you the bay'ah. The hadith says he dragged the hands of the Imam and he put it in the hand of Abu Bakr. So this hadith even sheds more light that the Imam salam did not willingly give the bay'ah. And this is a very important point that we have to consider when examining the allegiance of the Imam salam 
with the rulers of his time. Now interestingly, you will find that many scholars of other schools of thought in history, they realized that the bay'ah which the Imam give was by coercion. And obviously any act that is done under coercion is not valid. So what did they do? They had to come up with a way. They had to come up with a way to validate the bay'ah of the Imam alayhi salam. So what did they do? They said, they came up with narrations stating that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam after six months, after Lady Fatima al-Zahra salawatullahi alayha, after she passed away, she was martyred, the Imam alayhi salam came and gave his bay'ah willingly. A number of scholars have mentioned this. In fact, there's a hadith in Bukhari attributed to Aisha. She says that Fatima died angry with my father, Abu Bakr. Who says this? Aisha. In which book? Bukhari. She died angry. Not only angry. She says, wajida, awajadat, meaning extreme anger. She died angry with my father. However, after, therefore during her lifetime, Ali did not give the bay'ah. After she passed away, after six months, Ali ibn Abi Talib came and he gave bay'ah to my father Abu Bakr. So we have these narrations claiming that the Imam السلام, gave bay'ah after six months. And the reasoning they give is even more ridiculous than these ahadiths themselves. For example, the same hadith says that Imam Ali, the reason why he didn't give bay'ah during the lifetime of Fatima was out of respect for her because he knew that she had a dispute with Abu Bakr. He didn't really want to upset her or disappoint her. So he waited till she died, then he gave bay'ah. He didn't want to upset her. Secondly, during her life, Imam Ali had a strong back. His wife Fatima, she's the daughter of the Prophet, people respected him. When he lost Fatima, he didn't have any more supporters. So to save his face and position in society, he went and he worked it out with Abu Bakr. Look at the reasoning that they give. Now we have to analyze this hadith that says the Imam السلام, gave bay'ah after six months. We pose a number of questions. Number one, was Abu Bakr a legitimate Khalifa in the eyes of Ali or no? If he was, why did he wait six months? Oh, so he doesn't upset his wife? So he will abandon his religious obligation not to upset Fatima al Zahra? Is that acceptable? If he did not recognize him as the legitimate Khalifa, what made his, what changed his mind six months later? So if something suddenly happened? Jibra'il came down to him and told him, Oh Ali, no, he's the correct Khalifa. What happened suddenly? So that Ali ibn Abi Talib wait six months for him to come and give the bay'ah. Just simply by analyzing this, you automatically know that it's flawed. That's the first question that we pose. Number two, this hadith in Bukhari is clearly stating that Fatima alayhi salam she was upset with Abu Bakr, she was extremely angry with him. And therefore the Imam السلام, out of respect for Fatima, he did not give bay'ah. The question is, Fatima alayhi salam, when she is angry at the Khalifa, did she recognize him as the legitimate Khalifa or no? The daughter of the Prophet. The one whom Bukhari says Allah has pleased for her satisfaction and he's displeased for her displeased for her displeasure. Did she recognize the first Khalifa as the Imam of her time or no? Because all Muslims know that if you die without knowing and pledging allegiance to the Imam of your time, you die which death? You die the death of Jahiliyyah. Did the Daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa died the death of Jahiliyyah, God forbid. If we accept this hadith, then that's what it means. That she died the death of Jahiliyyah. Is this acceptable? Sayyidat Nisa al alameen the leader of the woman of the world. 
she will die the death of Jahiliyyah? So this in itself told, tells you that Fatima did not recognize the leadership of Abu Bakr. And therefore Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, did not recognize the leadership of Abu Bakr. Thirdly, as for their justification that Imam Ali had no supporter after Fatima, he was so lonely, he was forced and to go and give the bay'ah. This is even more flawed. Ali ibn Abi Talib, whom the Prophet, peace be upon him, describes, Ali yun ma'al haq, wal haqq ma'a Ali. Truth is with Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Ali is with the truth. Ali is with the Quran, and the Quran is with Ali. Ali is the most knowledgeable of my ummah. He is the most just of my ummah. Can we accept that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, because he felt lonely, now suddenly he's going to abandon his responsibility and go and give the bay'ah? This is absolutely unacceptable, it's ridiculous. Therefore, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, was taken to the masjid, yes. He was forced to extend his hand to give the bay'ah under the sword. But that does not mean that the Imam السلام, gave any legitimacy to the caliphs of his time. The stance of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, was quite clear. So this is regarding Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him. What about Imam al Hassan? You will find some theologians and scholars in history coming and saying, Imam al Hassan, salamullah alayhi, he pledged allegiance to Muawiyah. So you have an Imam of Ahlul Bayt who recognized one of those rulers as the legitimate caliph to the Prophet. Imam al Hassan, salamullah alayhi, never pledged allegiance. What happened was a treaty, a peace treaty that he signed with Muawiyah. And the Imam alayhi salam, when you read the treaty, he makes it very clear that he did not pledge allegiance to Muawiyah. It was simply a treaty like the one his grandfather, the holy messenger of God, like the one he signed with the pagans of Mecca. Did the Prophet give them bay'ah? Did he recognize them? to have authority? Absolutely not. The Prophet simply made a peace treaty with them. What does a peace treaty mean? That we will not fight. Let's make peace. If one of you violates the peace treaty, then yes, we are not obliged to go by it. And the pagans of Mecca, they broke the peace treaty. Imam Ali, the Imam, Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, he signed a peace treaty with Muawiyah. He told him, I will stop the war. Yes, you're an aggressor. And he made clear that Muawiyah was an aggressor. You're an oppressor. You are not the caliph, the true caliph to the Prophet. However, for the sake of the religion, for the sake of the believers, because had those wars continued, no believer would have remained, brothers and sisters. All the companions of the Imam were getting killed one after the other. In order to save the religion of Islam and to expose Muawiyah to the world because Muawiyah was very deceitful, the Imam wanted to expose him that this man will betray the peace treaty. This man is a liar. And that's exactly what he did. As soon as he signed the peace treaty with Al Imam Al Hassan, he took the peace treaty, he threw it on the floor and he stepped on it. People were shocked. We thought you were righteous. We thought you were honest. This was the Imam's method in exposing Muawiyah. So the Imam السلام, made it very clear that he's not pledging allegiance to Muawiyah. He was simply signing a treaty to end the war, to end the violence. Therefore, in no way did he recognize his authority. And on a number of occasions, the Imam السلام, would publicly attack Muawiyah to delegitimize him, that he is not the true Khalifa to the Holy Prophet. Let's now come to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Some will argue, they will tell you, okay, you are saying that Imam Ali did not pledge allegiance because they threatened to kill him. He did not want to be killed. He did not want his family members to be killed. He did not want some of the believers of that time to be killed. How come Imam al Hussein did not give allegiance? Why don't you use the same philosophy here? Why didn't Imam al Hussein follow the path of his father? 
And he could have said the same thing. He could have rationalized his stance in the same way. Yazid is forcing me. It's under compulsion. It's under coercion. I have no choice. If I don't, he's going to massacre me and massacre my family members and massacre the believers. How come you don't apply the same standard to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? What's different about Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is their personal circumstances. Yes, they were different. But what remained the same is that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, the reason why he gave the allegiance under force was to save the religion of Islam. At the time of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, it was the exact opposite. Had Imam al Hussein given allegiance to Yazid, that would have been the end of Islam. Because the Muslim Ummah had gone so corrupt with the corruption and the oppression of Bani Umayyah, such that people were in a deep sleep. You needed a way to awaken them. People recognized Yazid, yes, he's the Khalifa to the Prophet. This is Islam. People were turning away from the faith of Allah. They were just Muslims by name, like many people you find today, just Muslims by name. They don't practice any part of the faith. Oppression had was per pervasive in their society. So the Imam alayhi salam wanted to awaken them. Had the Imam pledged allegiance to Yazid, other people would have said, look, Hussein gave allegiance, we don't have any obligation. Let the Bani Umayyah continue their mischief. It's none of our business. The Imam alayhi salam refused to give allegiance because he wanted to save the religion of Islam. Whenever you look at the lives of the Imams and their stance, always ask this question. What the Imam did, don't look at his personal circumstances, whether he would be in danger, his family would be in danger, always ask the question, what about Islam? What would have happened with the religion of Islam? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib extended his hand to save Islam. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam refused to give his hand because of the religion of Islam. To save the religion of Islam. Now you'll find them telling you, but there's a hadith which Al Mufid narrates in his book Al Irshad, which says that Imam al Hussein was willing to give the bay'ah to Yazid. So how do you justify that? He mentions that. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala, he asked for a private meeting with Umar ibn Sa'd. Umar ibn Sa'd was the commander of Yazid's army, Ibn Ziyad's army. The Imam requested a private meeting with him. The Imam alayhi salam told him, Ibn Sa'd, I did not come here for bloodshed and for war. You don't want me to go to Kufa? Okay, I won't go to Kufa. I'll go back to where I came from. He said, no, that's not an option. He told him, okay, I'll just go to a different land. I'll go to Yemen. I won't go back to Medina. I won't go back to Mecca. If you're very sensitive about these holy sites, I'll go to Yemen. Umar ibn Sa'd writes a letter to Ibn Ziyad, who was the governor of Kufa. He tells him, oh Ibn Ziyad, I've met privately with Hussein ibn Ali. He does not want war with us. He said, he will not go to Kufa if we don't want him to go to Kufa. To avoid the war, he's willing not to go to Kufa. And he's willing to go to some far place such as Yemen. Or he'll go back to Medina or just any other city. Then the hadith states in the letter, Umar ibn Sa'd wrote to ibn Ziyad, or Hussein ibn Ali is also willing to give you the bay'ah. He's willing to give you the bay'ah. So they will cite this hadith, you will see on many forums. They will cite this hadith, which says, see, in your own books, which is authored by a Shaykh al Mufid. He's narrated this hadith, which says, Al Imam al Hussein alayhi was willing to give bay'ah to Yazid. That means maybe he recognized that Yazid was a legitimate ruler. So how do you Shia curse him when Imam al Hussein alayhi was willing to give him the bay'ah? 
When you analyze this hadith, you will find that this was a fabrication by Umar ibn Sa'd. Why? Umar ibn Sa'd, from day one, he did not want a battle. It was very clear. Umar ibn Sa'd, he really tried his best to avoid the war. Because Umar ibn Sa'd knew who Imam al Hussein was. He knew that he would take himself to hell by killing the grandson of the Prophet. In lines of poetry, he clearly states, he says, by killing him, then there is no escape from hell. He knew that very well. And he knew this would disgrace, disgrace him in history. But his shahwa, his temptation, his desires, his love of dunya blinded him. Because Ibn Ziyad had promised him mulk al-ray, the, the governorship of Ray, of Iran. He told him, I will appoint you the governor of Ray. Now back then, Ray was very important. It had a lot of resources. Geographically, it was very important. So he found himself in this crisis. Kill Hussein and get a Ray, or not kill Hussein, but you won't get anything. He wanted to avoid the war, and he told Ibn Ziyad on a number of occasions. He tried to advise him to avoid the war, but Ibn Ziyad wanted the battle. In the end, he failed, Umar ibn Sa'ad. He succumbed to his desires. So this was a fabrication from Umar ibn Sa'ad. He wrote in the letter to, to Ibn Ziyad, Oh, Ibn Ziyad, Hussein is willing to go back. That was true. Imam al Hussein did tell him that. I don't want war. Let me go back. But then he added something from his own self to convince Ibn Ziyad not to go to battle. Because he wanted an easy way out. He wanted to be the governor of Ray, but without the battle and the bloodshed. He preferred that. So he made this fabrication and he told Ibn Ziyad, Hussein is willing to go back or he might give bay'ah to Yazid. Just so that Ibn Ziyad backs off and he tells him, okay, let's try to work it out with him. Let him go back and we'll think about it. But Ibn Ziyad was smart. He knew about Abdullah al Hussein. When he read the letter of Umar ibn Sa'ad, he says about Umar ibn Sa'ad, Ibn Ziyad says, he's a man who doesn't want bloodshed. He doesn't want his people to get killed. Meaning he recognized that this was a fabrication from Umar ibn Sa'ad. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam never offered to pledge allegiance to Yazid. If he wanted to pledge allegiance to Yazid, why in Karbala? In Medina? He could have pledged allegiance to Yazid and he could have gone all of it over with. So we see that Imam al Hussein never gave bay'ah to Yazid. He never recognized him as the legitimate caliph. And this was a fabrication from Umar ibn Sa'd. Because he wanted to avoid the war at all costs. Let's get to Al Imam Zayn al Abidin. What about Al Imam Zayn al Abidin? There's a hadith in the book of Kafi that says Yazid ibn Muawiyah he came to the city of Medina on his way to the Hajj or back from the Hajj and he declared in Medina that all you citizens of Medina you are my slaves and you have to come and admit that you're slaves to me one man came before Yazid he said I refuse you think you're better than me your father is better than me. I'm not going to admit to you that I am your slave. He told him, I will kill you if you don't. He said, do whatever you want. So Yazid ordered for this man to be slaughtered and killed. Then he met Al Imam Zayn al Abidin alayhi salam who was in Medina. He told him the same thing. Oh Ali ibn al Hussein, you have to admit that you're my servant or you're my slave. The Imam salam tells him, what happens if I don't? He tells him, if you don't, your fate will be the same fate of that man which I killed. So I will kill you as well. In that case, Imam Zayn al-Abidin salam told him, okay, I will admit that I am your slave. And Yazid spared him. So some will use this hadith which is in the book of Kafi, a very authentic source. Even the chain of the hadith is authentic according to many perspectives. 
How do you justify this? How did Al Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam pledge allegiance to Yazid? Number one, assuming that the hadith is correct, the Imam alayhi salam did not pledge him allegiance and recognize his caliphate. The Imam alayhi salam simply knew that Yazid is crazy. He's going to kill him like that man and kill others. All he wants him to say is, I'm your servant. And this is taqiyya, to protect your life. You are required by Islamic law to protect your life. So the Imam alayhi salam simply said that to him. This is not bay'ah. In fact, everyone knew at the time what the stance of Ahlul Bayt was with Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Even if we accept that Al Imam Zain al Abidin salam told Yazid that I am your servant because Yazid threatened to kill him. Everyone knew at the time this was not giving bay'ah. This was not recognizing Yazid as the legitimate ruler because the stance of Zain al Abidin was very clear from day one. There was no confusion about it. Number two, Imam Zain al Abidin, when he was chained in Damascus and Sham, when he was weak and ill, before Yazid, he did not give bay'ah. You think he's going to give bay'ah in Medina? In his hometown? With his supporters? This is absolutely ridiculous. Imam Zain al Abidin salam, never gave bay'ah to Yazid. Number three, Al Alam al Majlisi in his book, Mir'at al Uqul, what does he say? He says there's a flaw in this hadith because history documents that Yazid never came to Medina after killing Al Imam Al Hussein. In fact, he never left Medina until he died. So there's a flaw in this hadith because the hadith says Yazid came to Medina and he had this conversation with Al Imam Zain Al Abidin. Now some scholars have said it was probably the governor of Yazid, Muslim ibn Uqba, and some of these narrators got confused, they thought it was Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Otherwise Yazid never went to the city of Medina. So it could have been his governor. He dispatched his governor, and remember his governor was such a ruthless dictator. You know what he did in Medina? Read about the event of the Harra. Go search it, Google it, see what happened in Medina. For three days, the soldiers of Yazid declared Medina as their territory. They slaughtered the men. They raped thousands of women. They desecrated the mosque of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. This is the history of Bani Umayyah. And some people today, they glorify the Bani Umayyah. Oh, they expanded the Muslim empire. Allahu Akbar. And the very sacred city of the Holy Prophet was desecrated like that. Read about the event of the Harra. Muslim ibn Uqba, he commanded the army of Yazid to ransack Medina. For three days they looted all the property, all the belongings of the Muslims. And Muslim ibn Uqba, he made an announcement, Oh you citizens of Medina, you are, sla you are all slaves to Yazid. One analysis is that Al Imam Zain al Abidin, he came forth, and the exchange that happened between him was with, was with Muslim ibn Uqba, not Yazid ibn Muawiyah. The Imam wanted to save the lives of the Muslims. So he wanted to teach the Muslims in Medina a way out. So this lunatic stops the bloodshed. So he came forth and he told them, Look, Muslim ibn Uqba, okay, okay, we're slaves to Yazid, get out of here. Stop desecrating the city of the Prophet. This was in no way giving allegiance to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Therefore, brothers and sisters, this was an examination of the four first four Imams of Ahlul Bayt and whether they pledged allegiance to the rulers of their time. We also have an Imam of time, brothers and sisters. Many question, how do I pledge allegiance to the Imam of my time? Because the hadith says, if you don't pledge allegiance to the Imam of your time, if you don't recognize the Imam of your time, you don't give bay'ah to the Imam of your time, you die, you, you die the death of jahiliyyah. You will find many of the youth, they asked about the Imam of time. Al-Imam al-Mahdi. What can I do to give bay'ah to Al-Imam al-Mahdi? You will find many of them reciting dua al-ahd for 40 days. That's wonderful, that's great. 
Many of them searching for the Imam. Some people go to Masjid al-Sahla 40 weeks. They go to Jamkaran 40 weeks. Trying to meet the Imam of time. I know many people, they tell me, say it. Teach me something so I can see the Imam in my dream. There are many who are searching for the Imam of their time. And that's good. It's good to have that passion and love for the Imam of your time. However, is that how you meet the Imam of your time? To go search for him in a mosque? To try to see him in your dream? No, brothers and sisters. If you want to see an Imam al-Mahdi, Allahu ta'ala farajah, then you can start... Then if, if you want to see the Imam of your time, then maybe you can start seeing him in the orphans by sponsoring them. If you want to see the Imam of your time, then maybe you will find him in those poor people who need your assistance. If you want to meet the Imam of your time, you can see him in your parents, which you've neglected, and maybe once a year you pick up the phone to talk to your parents. With your family members, with your relatives, every community I go to, brothers and sisters, you will find family members not talking to one another. A brother does not talk to his brother. A sister-in-law does not talk to her sister-in-law. And they boycott one another over petty issues, misunderstandings. And everyone thinks they're right. You want to see an Imam al-Mahdi, Allah ta'ala farajah. Maybe you should start changing these things in society. Then you will see him. Because an Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam in one hadith, what does he say? He says, if you want to be amongst the true supporters of the Mahdi, then you do two things. Yes, we wait for the Imam. But how do you wait? He says, two things. فَلْيَعْمَلْ بِالْوَرَعْ وَمَكَارِمِ الْأَخْلَاقِ You want to be amongst the true supporters of the Mahdi? Then have piety, be mindful of God, avoid sins. And number two, uphold the moral values of the religion of Islam. You will find that Imam al-Mahdi in the moral values. You don't need to recite Dua al-Ahd for 40 days and thinking that's the only way for you re to reach the Imam. No. In these moral and ethical values, brothers and sisters, you will find al-Imam al-Mahdi. You can find him in those refugees and immigrants who just settled here and they have no one. There you will find the Imam of your time. Because that's what he expects from us. He expects us to show our humanity, to uphold humanitarian projects. This is what the Imam السلام, expects from his followers. فَلْيَعْمَلْ بِالْوَرَعْ وَمَكَارِمِ الْأَخْلَاقِ Allah, Allah fil aytam. This is the wasiyah of Amir al mumini Be mindful of God when it comes to the yateen. How many orphans do we have around the world? What have I done to sponsor these orphans? People who have nothing, nothing. They've lost their parents. They suffer from extreme poverty. People who are suffering on a daily basis. Allah, Allah fil aytam. Am I a Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib or not? On such a night, brothers and sisters, I want to take your hearts to one of the orphans of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. According to historical accounts, she was three years old. Her name was Ruqayya, or some recognize her as Sakina. This young daughter of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, who is buried in Sham today. Sham was the headquarters of the Umayyad dynasty, but subhanAllah. See how Allah plans. She dies there until today. She has a flag there. She has a mausoleum there. And people from all around the world flock to visit her shrine in Sham, in Damascus. When the caravan of Abi Abdullah al Hussein arrives in Damascus with the women, with the children, in what state? They were, all, they were all chained with a rope, with chains. And Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam, they had placed this huge chain on his neck. He had to borrow 
a piece of cloth on his way to Sham because that chain was eating the flesh of Al Imam Zain al Abidi. He wanted to alleviate the pain. So he lifted it, he removed it a bit. The narrator says, I saw the blood gushing from the neck of Al Imam Zain al Abidi. And he put that piece of cloth. In this state, the caravan of an Imam al-Hussein arrived the city of Damascus. For several days, they put them in ruins, the ruins of Sham. There is no roof to block you from the sunlight, to shield you from the winds, from the hot days, the cold nights. There was a girl who was three years old in those ruins. She falls asleep. Apparently she sees her father Hussein. She misses her father. She's only three. She can't handle the pain of separation. Fourteen centuries later, we have this connection with Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. It says if we feel he's part of us, imagine his own three-year-old daughter. What kind of link, what kind of special relationship she had with Al Imam Al Hussein. She wakes up in tears. She's crying. They tell her, what can we do for you? What do you want? She says, I just want my father, Hussein. I just saw him in my dream right now. I want to be with my father, Hussein. I can't stand this separation. Everyone in those ruins, in those tents, they break into tears. In the midst of the night, you had this commotion. Yazid in his nearby palace, he hears this commotion. He asks his soldiers, what's going on? What's this commotion about? They tell him, oh Yazid, it's nothing important. One of the orphans of Hussein, she woke up from her sleep and she's asking for her father. And that's why they're crying. Look at the ruthless heart of this evil man. He says, okay, then what are you waiting for? Take to her the head of her father. They bring the head of Imam al Hussein. They put it in a tray and they cover it. They come to the ruins and they present that tray before Sayyid Ruqayy or Sayyid Sakina. She says, What is this? What have you brought to me? They told her, This is what you've been asking for. This is what you want. Remove the cover. Look at their ruthless hearts. She approaches that tray, O oh believers. As she removes the cover, what does she see, O oh believers? As she sees the severed head of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. She sees his stained beard with blood. She collapses on the head of her father. <laughs> oh my father Hussein, who is the one who offered me at such a young age? <laughs> Abba Hussein, man al-ladhi hazza waridak. My father Hussein, who was the one who severed your head? Abba, man al-ladhi khawab shaybak. My father Hussein, who is the one who stained your beard with your beard with blood? She begins to cry and cry. She couldn't help herself. She hugs the head, the severed head of Imam al Hussein. <laughs> she had missed him so much. It had been many days. She had not seen her father. She embraces the head of her father Hussein until she quiets down. Everyone in the in the tents in the ruins. At that point, Al Imam Zain al Abidi. He tells her, my aunt, lift my sister from the head of my father. 
for I swear by God her soul has departed her body Lady Zainab she goes and she carries that child that baby and she realizes that Sayyidah Ruqayya or Sakina she has passed away she could not handle the pain of separation she could not handle the sight of the severed head of her body they take her to the side Lady Zainab alayhi salam she asks one of the women over there one of the women in Syria she tells her, can you please wash her body so we prepare her for burial. That woman, she comes to wash the body of this orphan of Al Imam Al Hussein, but then she stops, she refuses. <laughs> Zainab tells her, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? Why don't you wash her body? You won't even touch the, the, the children of Ahl bayt She says, oh Zainab, I'm scared. She has this illness, all her body is black. <laughs> Zainab says, no, this is not an illness. On our, way, on our way from Karbala to here, whenever she would cry, they would beat her with the back of the spears. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا عَالَ مُحَمَّدٍ أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ وَالْعَاقِبَةُ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Brothers and sisters, raise your hands in dua. Many have asked us for dua. Many of you have someone whom you know who is ill, who is suffering. Many of you have difficulties, problems. Some have told me they have a court date. They have someone who's suffering from an illness. This is the moment of dua, brothers and sisters. Raise your hand in dua with tears, with broken hearts. Allah will answer our prayers, inshaAllah. Everyone raise your hand together and recite this holy verse five times with me. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ أَمَّنْ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءَ نسألك اللهم باسمك العز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يدي اللهم اشفي كل مريض اللهم اغني كل فقير اللهم فرج عن كل مكروب اللهم سد فقرنا بغناك اللهم غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم ارزقنا شفاعة الحسين اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي ثواب سورة الفاتحة مسبوقة من الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد